My self-esteem has been at an all-time low ever since the divorce. I'll never be the same again because of all the hurt that Fred has caused me. My feelings of inferiority have turned me into an emotional basket case. I've got to learn how to improve my poor self-image and feel good about myself again so that I can get over this mess and get on with my life. I know I'll never be able to grow as a Christian until I overcome my self-esteem issues. Thoughts like these are, are common today, even among Christians. And it's a little wonder because Christian books and podcasts and radio, television, video programs are promoting certain ideas about self-esteem or self-image, really, uh, that are contrary <clears throat> to Scripture. The idea is that self-esteem is essential for one's happiness, or the idea that self-esteem is essential for one's happiness ought to raise a red flag in the mind of any discerning believer who understands the implication, the implications of Philippians 2, 3. Do nothing from selfishness or vain conceit, empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard, let every man regard the other as more important than yourself. Our happiness is not related as much to how we esteem ourselves as to how we esteem others. Christians have been inundated with humanistic presuppositions that they believe to be theologically sound. So what are the theological fallacies or presuppositions, you know, the, the, the underlying hidden concepts behind what this gal has said? Well, first, that there is a part of man's non-material being, such as his mind or his conscience or his will, called the self-image. There is no organ of the soul called your self-image. Okay? Uh, you, ha you have an organ of the soul, you have, you have a mind, you have a will, you have a conscience, you have your emotions. There is no organ of your soul. There is no um, anthropological, biblical anthropological element of your being called a self-image. Another thing that's presupposed here is that inferiority is a feeling rather than a judgment or a self-evaluation. People are victims of something beyond their control. A good self-image, whatever that is, is a prerequisite to success and happiness. And God's ability to help people change is dependent upon one's having a good self-image. The concept of self-image doesn't exist in the Bible. The scriptures speak of man's heart, his mind, his conscience, his emotions, his thoughts, his motives, nothing about the self-image. We're mistaken when we view self-image as an entity in and of itself. It is not an organ of the soul that can be squashed, flattened, punctured, inflated, deflated, damaged, devastated. And whatever it is, it can't be fixed or modified or isolated directly. So what do you mean not directly? Well, in order to answer that question, we have to take a look at what self-image is through the lens of Scripture. We need to understand this, not in the words that man's wisdom teaches, but that which the Holy Spirit teaches, interpreting spiritual, in this case, concepts with spiritual or biblical terms. Self-image can be classified as a judgment that you make as you evaluate yourself. We're constantly evaluating ourselves. We're constantly asking ourselves all kinds of questions, right? Um, how am I doing? Am I pleasing God? What are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? Uh, constantly, we naturally evaluate ourselves. And so, the conclusion, as we answer those questions, essentially becomes our self-image, right? So self-image, it's not an organ of the soul. You don't have a self-image in there, okay? It's the conclusions 
you come to as you evaluate yourself, the judgments you make about yourself, the evaluations you make about yourselves, it's fundamentally cognition, right? Not an organ of the soul, it's just a, a thought process. We may feel good about that evaluation, or we may feel bad about that evaluation. So to say I feel inferior, no, you judge yourself to be inferior, rightly or wrongly, you judge yourself to feel inferior, to be inferior, I'm sorry, and then the feelings associated with that, you feel lousy about the fact that you've got inferiority judgments, okay? But it's not fundamentally a feeling. People don't actually feel inferior. Rather, they judge themselves to be inferior, feel awful about their self-evaluation. These inferiority judgments are at the root of all so-called self-image problems. As a Christian, your objective should not be to have a good or a positive self-image, but to have an accurate self-image based on biblically correct perceptions and evaluations. Our self-evaluations invariably fall into one of three categories. Let's take a look at what some of these um, evaluations might be. No one cares about me. I'm too short. I can't do anything right. I'm a terrible husband. I don't have a very high IQ. I'm lazy and undisciplined. I don't manage my time well. I'm a slow learner, not a good public speaker. I don't sing very well, not a good athlete. I'm slow to acknowledge my faults. I have a quick temper. So this is just a smattering, just an example of someone's self-image. So you see, it's not a part of your soul, so to speak, not in a sense of a biblical anthropology, but it is a part of your thought process. It's the evaluations you make, it's the conclusions you come to as you ask yourself these self-evaluation questions. So the first thing we need to do is to understand, and that's what we're doing right now, the biblical basis of self-image. Um, let me make sure I'm aligned here. Okay, so one of the first things I will do, or I will, it's in the book now, so I'll have people do it in the book, but I'll have them make a list of all the things in which they feel inferior. So your homework assignment is to go home and to come back with a list of all the areas in which you judge yourself to be inadequate or inferior, right? And so that's the list we, we just looked at, right? So that's the homework assignment. Now, when I get this piece of paper in my hand, what am I looking at? I'm basically looking at a black and white photograph of their self-image, or at least the negative side of their self-image. Now, now that I have this, then we can go back to scripture and help them understand how to uh, address all the things on the list. So we're going to evaluate and classify each judgment. Now, there are three different classifications. This category one, the first classification has to do with the accuracy of our perceptions. The second category has to do uh, with the values that's attached to the uh, evaluation. And the third has to do with, um, actually let me just do it this way, it'll be easier just to explain it this way. So three different categories. First category is inaccurate perception, right? The effects of sin on our minds hinder us from being able to interpret life from God's point of view. That's one reason we're so dependent on the Bible. What's more, the Bible says our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked. Uh, who can know it? And so the fall has affected our judgment. The fall has affected everything. But our judgment, I mean our sense of humor, everything. And so sometimes we are able to, to come to conclusions, to perceive things in such a way that they do not conform to reality. Whatever things are true, honest, just, and pure, whatever things conform to reality versus whatever things are fanciful, right? <clears throat> we have the ability 
to misperceive things, and that's what we want to identify. Which of my inferiority judgments fall into the first category that, um, you know, I think they're true, but technically they're really not true? A, person's who's in, a person whose inferiority judgments are the result of inaccurate perceptions can learn how to change those perceptions, primarily with the, scripture, with the assistance of Scripture and secondarily with the advice of wise, objective friends. So let's take, let's take this, okay, and the second, second category is accurate but not sinful. Okay, so it's true, I am inadequate, I am inferior, I, you know, I don't know how to make, what's the name of those delicious pastries I just had? Pastanico. Pastanico. I don't know how to make pastanico. Now, I can make orancini and a lot of Italian things, but, you know, I don't, I, uh, I'm inadequate, I'm not really a great soccer player, okay? So it's accurate, but it's not sinful. God doesn't call me to be a pastry chef. God doesn't call me to be a soccer player. So it's not a sin for me to be inferior, even woefully inferior in areas that don't matter to God. When you put them on God's scale, like they don't weigh anything. It's like, you know, I made you that way. This is not a moral issue. I made you that way. You need to accept the fact that this is the way I made you. Stop comparing yourself to other people and be thankful for the fact that I made you as a unique individual and, and not put the emphasis on the wrong syllable. <laughs> and then, of course, there are those things that are accurate and sinful. So let's just... Uh, All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to take that list of inadequacies and we're going to put them in each of these categories. And, and you know, they'll generally fit in one category. Every once in a while you have a little bleed over into another category. But let's just take them one at a time and you tell me which category they go in. No one loves me or cares about me. Is that inaccurate perception, accurate but not sinful, accurate and sinful? Sorry? Inaccurate perception, good. I'm too short. Okay, good. Not sinful. I'm a terrible husband. If it's accurate, then yes, it would be. It would be what I miss here. Uh, oh, I can't do anything right. Sorry. Yeah, I can't do anything right. Okay, uh, inaccurate perception. I mean, I just say, so wait a minute. So you can't do anything right. Like, so God, you're a Christian, yeah. So God has given you gifts, right? Yeah. And you can't even use your gifts the right way? Oh. Okay, I'm a terrible husband. I don't have a very high IQ. Okay, right? It's accurate, maybe, but it's uh, not a sin to have a low IQ. Um, I'm lazy and undisciplined. Okay, accurate and sinful. I don't manage my time well. Accurate and sinful. I'm a slow learner. Accurate but not sinful. I'm not a good public speaker. Okay. I don't sing well. Okay. I'm not a good athlete. I'm slow to acknowledge my faults. Okay. And uh, I have a quick temper. All right. Now, the reason this is important is because the solution to each of these inferiority judgments is different. You can't really solve a category one inferiority judgment with a category two or three solution. Each category requires, each category of inferiority judgment requires a different biblical solution. So in the case of inaccurate perceptions, you must learn how to think biblically. You must have to, have to change your perception. You must be willing to challenge your perception in primarily through scripture um, and even with the help sometimes of other people. For category two, 
accurate but not sinful inferiorities. What needs to change? Not change in perception, but change in what? Attitude is close. Values. You know, you're putting so much value on being a soccer player that it's upsetting you and depressing you because you're valuing athletics or sports or money or whatever more than you should. And you're not going to uh, uh, correct this type of inferiority judgment unless you adjust your values to that which value God values it. You know, if God doesn't value that, then you shouldn't value it more than God does. If God values this more than this, then you should put the emphasis on changing the things that God wants you to change rather than spending so much time, wasting so much time trying to change and fix things that God says do not really need to be fixed. I mean, not that it's wrong to, you know, take pastry baking lessons, but you shouldn't be beating yourself if you have time, right? That's another thing. Uh, sometimes my wife will give me a hard time about something that's, you know, sort of a preference. It's not really a sin. And I've said, to her, honey, okay, I'll try to work on that. But like, I've got, I've got issues in my life that are really sin issues. Don't you think the Lord would have me rather work on this and this before I work on that? I mean, you get what I'm saying? And then in terms of the third category, we have to basically change our behavior. All right, so let's talk first about how to correct inaccurate perceptions. Zach, just so that I know, what time am I aiming for? What time do I have to land the plane? Okay, okay, oh, we're good. Okay, so again, we're going to look at changing the perception, our perceptions. Okay, number one, um, I don't know if you have this in the notes, I think you do. Do you have the details of this in the notes? Okay, well, you'll, 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 you'll become apparent in a, in a moment. Number one, evaluate the available data on which you have based your erroneous perceptions. Do you have that in the notes? Okay, sorry, I don't have it on the screen. I'll go slow. Evaluate the available data on which you have based your erroneous perceptions. The Bible says, he who trusts in his own heart is a fool, but he who walks wisely will be delivered. Asking yourself the right kind of self-examination questions can help you deliver yourself from much misery by, gaining, by, getting, you right, by getting right to the heart of the issue. I tell myself that no one loves me or cares about me. Can I not recall one person who does? I'm, I'm convinced that I can't do anything right. Is there that one thing that I've done right this week? Job's three friends didn't catch their wrong view of God's justice or Job's real problem. Elihu, the fourth friend, listened for days, collected the data, and then made an accurate diagnosis. The problem, Job, is that you're justifying yourself rather than or before God. All right, number two, invalidate erroneous perceptions on the basis of two or three witnesses. Every fact is to be confirmed by the testimony of two or three witnesses. This is both in Deuteronomy and 2 Corinthians. This is a biblical principle. Well, that's really a command. Call together three or four of your wisest, most mature friends or people you know, Explain your perception to them. Ask them for their read on the category one inferiority judgments. Listening to the testimony of several others with a different perspective can do much to effectively change your inaccurate perceptions. The Bible says in Proverbs 18, 17, the first to present his cause seems just, but his neighbor comes and examines him. Well, you're gonna put your judgment on trial. You know, I'm telling myself this is true, and you're going to call wise friends among you uh, that you know and get them together and say, look, this is how I'm seeing it. Is this accurate? Sometimes when, I, sometimes when I'm writing a book and I'm, I put something in there that, you know, like, no one's written about for years, 
I sent it to some friends of mine. <laughs> I e emailed them a copy of it. I've got some friends, you know, kind of who I typically send this to. And in the subject line it says, am I a heretic? Question mark. You know, I just want someone to help me make sure that my thinking on this is right. Some of the witnesses to consider helping you rethink your self-evaluations. And by the way, I don't know if I'll say this anywhere else, but you know the word repent, metanoia, means to change, the Greek word is to change your mind. Well, meta means again, right? And noise has to do with your mind. And so really you could, etymologically, you could translate the word repent to rethink, to think again. So there's a sense in which we kind of have to repent, rethink of our unbiblical perceptions. Anyway, who are who some of the people that we can use as witnesses to help us uh, to testify for or against our perceptions in this case? Spouses, children, parents, friends, church members, church leaders, relatives, counselors. Just try to find some wise people and say, look, this is how I see myself. What do you think? And then in the mouth of two or three, if, you, if the preponderance of evidence, people are saying, no, I really don't see that, then by faith, you need to be suspicious of your judgment and trusting of the Christians around you that, um, that have a different perception, arguably a more biblical, is that me? A more biblical perception of what is, uh, what's going on in your life. Okay, number three. Learn to distinguish fact from feelings. Again, evidence from emotion. This is kind of like what we talked about in the last hour about the bridge. Many things may influence or generate our emotions from physical illness to sleep loss to the opinion of others to the sinful responses of others to misinterpreting information to sinful motives to the anchovy and artichoke pizza we had for dinner last night that's giving us indigestion today and affecting the way we think. If you want to correct your inaccurate perceptions, you must learn to interpret the data in light of scripture, not in light of your feelings. Number four, meditate and memorize, uh, yeah, med memorize and meditate on Ecclesiastes 7, 21-22. Again, the, the, the greatest, one of the greatest causes, if not the greatest cause of inferiority is comparing with other people, right? When they measure themselves, Paul says, by themselves, and when they compare themselves among themselves, they are not wise. They are without understanding. We really have to be careful not to compare ourselves with others because we don't know what's going on in the other person's life. We don't know about their past. We don't know about their childhood. We don't know about the current circumstances. We don't know, you know about their physical condition. There are so many things that we don't know about that other person. To just, so just to say, well, this person is better than I am in, in this area or I'm better than this person, you're always going to find somebody better. You're always going to find somebody worse than you are. Don't compare yourself with other people. If you want to compare yourself, compare yourself Backwards, where I am today compared to where I was yesterday, am I really growing as a Christian? And compare yourself forward. Okay, when I'm glorified, when I, when, when I ha you know, no longer have to deal with my progressive sanctification because I'll be perfectly sanctified, I'll be like Christ. Like, how do I compare with that person, right? But please, guard against comparing yourself with other people. Ecclesiastes 7, 21 and 22. Do not pay attention to every word that is spoken, lest you hear your servant curse you. For you also, you likewise, have many times cursed others. Having a critical, contentious, I'm sorry, critical condemnatory attitude is something that all of us struggle with. And we have all said unkind, untrue things about other people, offhanded comments. And, you know, after the words come out of our mouth, we realize, you know, that was unkind and that wasn't true. We all have a tendency to do this. And so don't, Solomon says, don't take all of these criticisms to the bank. If there's a biblical basis for it, evaluate it and consider it. But uh, don't focus too much on all the things that people say because, um, because it's not always true, it's not always accurate. They shouldn't be judging you because they don't have all the facts and you shouldn't be taking their rash judgments to heart as though they were gospel truth. Some people 
proud ones, feel a verbal pin, 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 pin prick as though they have been stabbed through the heart. They're especially prone to take criticism, constructive or otherwise, as personal rejection rather than an indication of the reprover's love. Let's face it, even though we all know it's wrong, even though we do not want others to do it to us, most of us regularly make very unloving judgments about others. Here's how Richard Baxter put it. Few people know the circumstances and reasons for what you do. They will presume to criticize you before they will hear what you have to say. Had they done so, they would have absolved you of all charges in their mind. It's rare to meet, even among professing believers, who are sincerely committed to Christ, those who are fearful and sensitive about sinning in the area of rash, ungrounded judging. The point of this passage is that since we're prone to make charitable judgments about others, we should remember and be merciful, not react to those who make uncharitable judgments about us. Get yourself some thicker skin by developing the mindset of Solomon who expressed uh, as expressed in this passage. I mean, okay, is it such an intolerable trial to have someone think that about me, especially someone who's really speaking off the top of his head and foolishly answered a matter before he understood it? I mean, is that really such an unbearable trial? Well, if you're proud, it is. If you're a proud person, you're going to feel a pinprick, like someone has, you know, given you a much more painful and serious wound. Five, avoid making unbiblical prophecies about the future. Inaccurate perceptions are often exacerbated by the sin of worry. Worry is the fear, uh, uh, is fear in the absence of actual danger. It is overestimating the possibility of danger and magnifying the degree of potential adversity. You like looking at everything through a magnifying glass. Worry is often a complicated, is often a compl accompanied by imaginary, pessimistic, and foreboding outcomes that have been distorted above all likelihood. Oh, I would never be able to face anything like that. Oh, that would be unbearable. I would never be able to survive the devastation if that happened to me. Oh, I just know I'm going to have a panic attack when... Does your mind tend to magnify the terribleness of a future event before, above all probability, as well as minimize the available grace of God should that improbable providence befall you? You're not a prophet, or the son of a prophet, or the daughter of a prophet, so stop making prophecies. And if you're going to prophesy about the future, as I said last night, you need to do so, inject your thoughts with biblical hope. Yeah, that could happen. But, you know, God promises that he'll give me the grace. That could happen, but God says he's going to cause all things together for good. Maybe if it does happen, even though I'm praying that it won't happen, you know, maybe there's a reason that in God's mind is more important than my reasons for not wanting it to happen. Six, practice bringing every thought into captivity by writing out accurate perceptions based on scriptural evidences. Of course, this passage is based on 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing rising up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Here's another helpful exercise you can try. Let's see if I can do this without the PowerPoint slide. Okay, so you're going you're gonna to have a chart. So picture this. Again, three columns, okay? It, it, at the top, uh, 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 across the top, column one is inaccurate perception. Column two is accurate perception. Column three is related scripture. I'm sorry, I don't know why I didn't put this in the, um, in the PowerPoint presentation. Okay, so first column, inaccurate perception. No one loves me or cares about me. Accurate perception, second column. The Lord loves me and cares for me. <clears throat> Third column, related scripture. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. 
casting all your anxiety upon him for he, because he cares for you. Another accurate perception to counteract the inaccurate perception, no one loves me or cares about me. So this will be another one for column two. God has commanded others to love and care for me. Surely there are at least a handful of people in my church who are doing what God commands. Scripture. Since you have, obe uh, since you have in obedience to the truth purified your soul for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another with a pure heart. Surely there's got to be somebody at Western First Baptist who's doing that to me. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Okay, another example for an inaccurate perception, I can't do anything right. Accurate perception, category two, column two. I can't say I can as a Christian. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can... I'll sometimes say to my counselors, well, I just, you know, you can't say can as a Christian. Not in my office. I can do it. If God says you can do it, you can do it. But I, 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 you can learn it. How about, how about you start? I can learn to do all things through him and strength. But yeah, okay, I guess I can start with that. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives generally, who gives gracious, generously, and without reproach, and it will be given him. Anyway, I hope you get the idea of how that works. You're just going to take your accurate perceptions, figure out what's wrong with it, come up with a biblical alternative, and then reinforce it with the scriptures that support the biblical alternative. Okay, number seven. Learn to speak the truth in your heart. This is the bottom line when it comes to correcting inaccurate perceptions. It's the river into which all the aforementioned streams converge. I think I mentioned this yesterday. I talked about Psalm 15, the, the psalm of stability, right? It says, he who does these things will never be shaken. Well, one of the things that the stable person does is to speak the truth in his heart. The Apostle Paul commands us to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. What is the means by which this wonderful supernatural transformation takes place? The Holy Spirit uses the word of God in sanctifying power through the renewing of our minds. Now again, it is something that the Spirit does. Justification is, is something that the Spirit does and we're dead in our trespasses and sins and so basically we're powerless to do anything until God zaps us. But once we become Christians and we have the Holy Spirit, now... This sanctification part of the deal, this progressive sanctification, it is an act of God, but it's an act of God with which we can and must cooperate. We have to collaborate with the Holy Spirit. And of all the things we can do to, to collaborate with the Spirit's work in our life, the single best thing we can do is to internalize God's Word, to read it, to study it, to memorize it, to meditate on it, to listen to it, right? To the extent that the word of Christ is dwelling in us, to that extent we will be spirit-filled. To that extent we will have, we will unleash the Spirit's power in our lives because fundamentally the Spirit works through the word. Okay, so next we have... Category two, what do we do with those inferiority judgments that are accurate, but they're not sinful? First, make it your aim to thoroughly understand the doctrines of justification and positional sanctification. Not always, but many times, a person who struggles with a lot of category two um, issues don't really uh, understand justification the way that they should. I read a really good book a few years ago. It's not per se a counseling book, but I mean, it was the best book I read that year. Um, oh, I can't remember the author's name, uh, but I, we use it in the counseling center a lot. It's called Perfect Sinners. Have you read that, Perfect Sinners? Uh, I'm trying to think who the author is. Uh, he's a British guy. 
Anyway, it's a really cool book. It's available on Audible if you need to listen to it instead of read it. The name, the subtitle of the book is Seeing Yourself as God Sees You. And this book really helps people uh, in their attempts to go from seeing God as a judge to seeing him as a heavenly father. If someone can give me, Matt Fuller, that's right. Yeah, Matt Fuller, Perfect Sinners, really good book. Okay, behavioral problems are sometimes rooted in doctrinal errors. But what does the doctrine of sanctification have to do with my self-image? Simply this, people who are overly concerned about failing to achieve in areas where, in which God does not require achievement may be trying to earn favor with God. A thorough understanding of these two doctrines can set people free from the legalistic belief that their performance somehow earns them more of God's approval, more of God's, you know, more brownie points with God. An essential element of this biblical in, uh, indoctrination is scripture memory. Marinating your brain in passages such as Romans 3 through 5, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, Ephesians 1, 17, and following Hebrews 10:10, 10, 10, the book of Jude, will really help you focus your attention away from uh, fixing things that don't matter to God and accepting the fact that you really uh, are accepted in the beloved, and that, you, that you're just, you, your justification is kind of up and running at all times, sort of like, sort of like Windows. You know, I, I've been using this computer for days, and I, was, I, don't know, I don't know the last time I actually went into the settings and actually brought up the Windows screen. My justification is always up and running in the back of my mind. Sometimes I have to go there and remind myself, hey, you know what? You're not thinking like a justified person. But some people who struggle with inferiority judgments and perfectionism and other similar kinds of sins, I mean, they have to go to the Windows setting a lot and remind themselves and imbibe and understand and review the doctrine of justification because it's not, it's not working properly in their mind. Number two, reprogram your conscience by examining each area of doubt in light of the whole counsel of God. Sometimes people with inaccurate self-images develop unbiblical scruples about something they habitually do. This process, uh, this produces guilt and could interfere or could generate inferiority judgments. If I don't spend at least one hour each day in my quiet time, I'm not really having one. My children don't always obey the first time I ask them to, so I'm a terrible parent. If I don't go to church every time the door is open, I'm not being faithful. I actually counseled a woman one time who thought it was a sin to step on a cockroach. And she would, she would make her husband Every time there was a cockroach in the house, not squash him, but to gently capture him and release him or her outside. Now, the problem is <clears throat> her conscience was not programmed biblically. And so um, if she stepped on a cockroach purposefully and she thought it was a sin to step on a cockroach, she was sinning. Because he who squashes must squash in faith. If, if you squash and you're not squashing in faith, then you're, you're sinning, right? So what do you have to do with something like that? Well, little by little, you have to reprogram their conscience to help them understand, you know, look, you know, it's good to have compassion on, you know, God's creations, but at the end of the day, it's not a sin to step on a cockroach. To correct a weak conscience, you'll therefore have to take each unbiblical scruple back to the Bible to rectify each doubtful issue. Until you can do so and thus partake with a clear conscience, you must abstain from the questionable activity. You can reprogram your conscience biblically by locating, understanding, and learning to apply the appropriate scriptures to your scruples. Be cockroach passage. God has freely given us all things to enjoy. I don't know. All right, number three. Learn how to distinguish sin issues from issues that are not sinful. An important element of reprogramming the conscience is to know what is a sin and what is not a sin. 
It's the weaker brother who doesn't know the difference between the two. Your goal is to become a mature believer who does know the difference. Solid food, as Hebrews 5.14, solid food belongs to those who are mature, even to those who by reason of use have their senses, their conscience, exercised to discern the difference between good and evil. It may also be helpful for you to remember what the prophet Isaiah pronounced, um, that he pronounced a dreadful warning against those who call evil good but also on those who do the opposite. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. If God says something is good and you see it as evil, that's not a good thing. God has freely given us all things to enjoy. Who substitute, the verse goes on to say, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Perhaps the most important point to consider is this. If it's not a sin for you to be inferior in this area, it ought not to significantly affect your self-image. And if it does, you've got a serious um, adjustment to make in your values. You know, the most common way that this, I mean, the, the, probably these days, the most common way this is manifest is people with eating disorders. You know, they have a picture of themselves looking a certain way or different parts of their body looking a certain way and they, they, they essentially think it's a sin or act as though it were a sin for them to have a part of their body looking in a particular way when the Bible doesn't you know, prescribe that we all look that way. Fourth, remember that godly character is more valuable to God and therefore must be desired more than outward appearance and or human abilities. Again, we don't want to put the emphasis on the wrong syllable. God focuses on the inner man, right? The gentle and the quiet. Man looks at outward appearance. God focuses on the heart. Where we look not at the things which are seen, the things which are unseen. The things which are seen are temporal. The things that are, uh, the things that are seen are temporal. The things that are unseen are eternal. And so again, we've got to learn to focus on the things that matter to God. Our hide all these things in category two. When you put them on God's scale, he doesn't care about them. He doesn't value them. He doesn't value them. What he does value is your character. He, ca he cares about the category three things that are out of whack, not the, ca not the category two things. Chances are that whatever inferiority judgments you've placed in this column, you are valuing more than you are being conformed to the image of Christ. It's that simple. There's probably some external issue on which you're focusing more than God, something you believe, if corrected, would cause you to be more attractive or more appealing to men. If you are a people pleaser, you will be more concerned with how man sees you than how, I'm sorry, if you are a people pleaser, yeah, if you are a people pleaser, and you shouldn't be, you'll be more concerned about how man sees you and correspondingly try too hard to please man than how God does. This will cause you to despise or think lightly of godliness and inordinately admire appearance and temporal achievement. Your goal is to learn and love the supreme value of Christ-like character over whatever external attraction after which you are now lusting. Here are some passages that would help you make the adjustment. Matthew 5, 3 through 12, Romans 8, 28 and 29, Colossians 3, 12 through 17, 1 Peter 1, 3 through 15. Actually, I'm going to preach on that on Sunday. 1 John 3, 2 and 3. 5. Learn to identify and correct legalistic, perfectionistic, and ascetic thought patterns. Don't be surprised to find any or all three of these showing up if you have a few, uh, if you have more than a few category two issues. These three are related. So what's the difference between legalism, perfectionism, and asceticism? Interesting, I, last year I wrote a little booklet on legalism. PNR, I just signed a contract with PNR to write a book on perfectionism. And asceticism, I don't know, maybe somebody else can do that. But what's the difference? Legalism is basically when you elevate man-made rules to the same level as God-given rules, the same level of culpability. Uh, when, when you have a rule that um, 
when you have a rule that you follow and you want other people to follow and believe that if you don't follow the rule, you're sinning or other people are sinning. The byproduct of a wrongly programmed conscience, legalism raised the standard of behavior higher than the Bible. The scribes and the Pharisees overvalued many of the man-made traditions to the exclusion of God's clear directives. So basically, when you say it's a sin to do something that God does not say is a sin, you're being legalistic. And it's bad enough for you to do it yourself, but boy, when you impose it on other people, that's really a problem. Can't believe Priolo is a Yankee fan. What's the matter with him? How could he do that? Do not speak evil of one another. He who speaks evil of his brother judges his brother and judge, speaks evil of judges and judges his brother speaks evil of the law. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge your brother? Well, I know that technically the Bible doesn't say don't be a Yankee fan, but it should. And, and why the Lord, the lawgiver, didn't put it in there, I don't know. He probably should have. I mean, do you see how arrogant that is? All right, perfectionism is an all-or-nothing mentality whose subjective standard is higher or more exacting than the Bible. This is a mutilated form of legalism. Perfectionists want to live a life free from the influence of sin, sickness, suffering, and Satan. I mean, you know, that's not for this world. That's for the next world. We have to live in a world filled with sin and sickness and suffering and Satan. It's not until the next world that we will not have sin and sickness and suffering and Satan. But perfectionist, you know, wants that now, um, I mean, to such an extent that he's not comfortable if he cannot do everything within his power to, uh, to get to that situation apart from the Lord doing it his time and his way. In short, they want God to give them in this life what he's promised only to give them in the next. A perfectionist pride, and that's his root issue, does not fully accept the doctrine of total depravity. Asceticism. That's basically the belief that God is somehow necessarily more pleased with me if I impose suffering and affliction on myself. The more I suffer for God, the more pleased he's going to be with me. So I'm going to put myself in this situation, and that's his right. Just show how much I love him because I'm willing to undergo such suffering for him. The ascetic individual tells himself, the more I punish myself, the more God will be pleased with me. It is a mindset that says, I will deprive myself of this pleasure, not as an acceptable sacrifice to God, but because he will be impressed with the misery I'm willing to put myself through for him. Number six, stop comparing yourselves to others. Can I already uh, cover this, 2 Corinthians 10, 12? But when they measure, actually, let me read the first part of the verse. If we are not bold to class or compare ourselves with others, with some of those who commend themselves, but when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves among themselves, they are without understanding. Okay, I covered all that. Um, okay, number seven. Learn how to glory in your infirmities, knowing that God's strength is made perfect in weakness. God delights in taking our natural weaknesses and using them to demonstrate his power. Concerning this thing, I implored the Lord three times that it might depart from me, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather boast about my weaknesses. I'm mean, thinking about that. Category two issues, we're not boasting in them. We're afraid of them. We're, you know, we're just petrified and, and mortified by them. And Paul actually boasts about them. I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell on me. Therefore, I am well content. I take pleasure in. I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And so the point is, these things that we, these weaknesses, these inferiorities, that we are so devastated by and strive inordinately to correct, uh, when we do that, we uh, short circuit 
God's ability, or not his ability, God's, uh, we short circuit the opportunity to allow God to show his strength through these weaknesses. When you can come to the realization that God may have actually intended, at least temporarily, for you to be inferior in certain areas of your category two, uh, in certain category two areas, so that his glory may be manifested in a wonderful way, your inferiorities can take on a whole new meaning. Rather than complaining about these inferiorities and spending inordinate amounts of time trying to straighten them out, straighten out that which God has made crooked, that's Ecclesiastes 7.13, You'll make better use of your time by using these inferiorities to glorify him and rejoicing in the opportunity to boast about how Christ's power is operating in your life. All right. Third category. Replacing sinful behaviors with their biblical alternatives. Final category of inferiority judgments, those that are accurate and sinful contain, are typically those that contain the, uh, the most issues. Most of the time when a person does this list and categorizes the, 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 uh, the majority of everything that they're inferior about, that they judge themselves to be inferior, uh, category three, their sin issues. And, you know, the thing you have to remember is you can preach the gospel to yourself a hundred times a day, a thousand times a week, whatever, uh, you can remind yourself all the time, I'm a child of the, con of the king. You can produce, uh, you can review um, all the doctrinal issues that uh, uh, pertaining to justification and positional sanctification. But as long as you are not working on correcting the category three things, you're going to have inferiority judgments. Again, not that you're going to be perfect, but to know you know, you're a failure only as long as you do nothing about the problem. The minute you take the first step in correcting your sin, right, you may not be a success, but you are no longer a failure. And so much of the self-image stuff that's been produced in the past has been telling people it's all about justification. It's all about seeing yourself as God sees you. And that is true. But you have to do both. If you just tell yourself all day long, you know, I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven, I'm justified, and you don't work on, at some level, you don't commit yourself to working on the sin issue in your life, you're still going to struggle with inferiority judgments. So, yes, you have to understand the gospel, but you also have to be willing to collaborate with the Holy Spirit in fixing the things in your life that you know are displacing them, that you know are in, they are inferiorities that you ought not as a Christian be inferior in. And again, nobody's perfect, but this is progressive sanctification. So the moment you start to begin to address, and you know, you can't really focus on more than one or two at a time. You can see them all in your peripheral vision. But the moment you start to focus on the category three issues, knowing that you are doing what the Bible says you should do to mortify the flesh, to gain control over that sin so that you're controlling it and it's not controlling you, then all of a sudden, the positional stuff is really going to take root. But if you ignore and neglect dealing with the sin in your life, it's not going to have a great impact on your ability to see yourself as God sees you. Your sin will keep you like my cataracts. Pray for me, next month I have surgery. Uh, my cataracts, they kind of fuzz everything out. Okay, so first, be sure you understand the doctrine of progressive sanctification. Understanding of justification provides the necessary motive for change, but rarely is sufficient to bring about lasting change in stubborn habits. Number two, make it your goal to replace sinful behaviors with their biblical alternatives. We talked about this last night. Remember when is a door, not a door. When it's a jar, right? When it's a car, no longer a car. When it turns into a driveway. When is a liar no longer a liar? When he stops lying, no. When he becomes a teller of the truth. When is a thief no longer a thief? When he stops stealing, no. He's just a thief between jobs when he stops stealing. He's no longer a thief when he replaces his thievery with diligence and generosity. Three, develop habits of godliness. A habit is something that is practiced so frequently that it becomes routine. It's a practice that's become so natural that it is accomplished quickly, easily, automatically, and unconsciously. We have this term in English, it's called second nature. 
Paul says to Timothy, exercise yourself for the purpose of godliness. And as we continually develop godliness, as we really make it our goal to become a truth teller as opposed to being a liar, to become diligent as, to, to, as opposed to being a thief, to be kind and tenderhearted and forgiving as opposed to, I mean, to being, uh, to being bitter. I mean, to focus like a laser on developing these qualities, our, our spiritual muscles grow. And after a while, our muscles get, our spiritual muscles exercise. The word gymnazo in the Greek, from which we get gymnasium and gymnastics. Over time, our spiritual muscles become stronger, and we can go into the gym, as it were, and pick up weights two years down the road that we could even, with one hand, that we couldn't even budge with two hands because our muscles are growing, and that's the idea. Exercise yourself for the purpose of godliness. And as you develop your spiritual muscles and you see those category three issues being replaced, being removed and replaced by godly character, it is going to impact your confidence and your, uh, your self-image. You're going to have less uh, inferiority judgments in those particular areas and you're going to have more confidence. Number four, Internalize those portions of God's word that address your sinful inferiority. I wish I had more time. When, uh, when I committed my life to Christ, I was 20 years old, and I basically, I basically made a list of all the sins that I knew of in my life. It was a long list of pages, you know, and I had a chart. Sin, scriptures related to, to the sin, and then date memorized. And so... As I was having my quiet time, when I would come across a passage that dealt with my sin, I would put it in this chart. It was a loose leaf notebook. It was way back in the dark ages. And um, I'd, I'd use that as my uh, memorization. So I, w I started memorizing tons and tons of scripture. And the overwhelming majority of scripture that I memorized after my commitment to Christ um, were related to my sins. And I just started memorizing scripture and meditating on it. And particularly, you know, not just scriptures that, you know, John 3, 16, that I may or may not use tomorrow. But I memorized those passages of scripture that dealt with the sanctification of the particular sins that I was dealing with. And that is, uh, that's really where my counseling ministry started. I had all the scripture memorized before I went to Bible college. I went up to Bible college and, you know, I was counseling all my all my dorm mates and you know word got out Lou you're a counselor you know you, you like you need to, I don't want to be a counselor I don't want to sit around counseling people all day how boring and then I, and they encouraged me to go to graduate school you know I didn't really want to go to get a degree in counseling but it says in the mouth of two or three witnesses every fact shall be established I had a dozen people telling me I should go and do this I go to graduate school and um I, I got exposed to all the secular theories, and I said, you gotta be kidding, this is, the, this is the state of the art of counseling today? The little bit of Bible knowledge that I have will blow this stuff away. And God used the exposure to these secular counseling theories to totally change the course of my life. I can do this, if this is the best the world has to offer, I can do this blindfolded with my hands tied behind my back because the little bit of scripture I know can blow this stuff away. And I didn't really study the scripture fully, formally, to learn how to counsel, but that's what God used to change my life. Anyway, internalizing, meditating, memorizing scripture is the key. Number five, look for <clears throat> idolatrous desires behind the sinful inferiorities. In other words, don't just deal with the surface sin, but what's in your heart that is uh, generating those sinful activities or thoughts. And then sixth, if you've not already done so, consider finding a biblically trained counselor to help you implement what you've just learned in the book. There's the book. Okay, let's take a break.